Our Holy Father, we recognize that the words that we're about to read are from you. They were written through your servants so many years ago, but are meant to be heard today, just as in the beginning. We ask as we open your word that you will come and be our teacher, that you will be the one who, who guides our eyes towards what needs to be seen, you will be in our minds as we contemplate your word through your spirit, you will show us how to apply what we read in our life this week. Again, Father, we're excited to hear what you have to say, what you have said, and what you will say to all generations to come here through your word, and ask that you come now and open our eyes to what we're about to read, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> Now I will lower my voice, because if I speak as loud as I was just speaking, we would scare people out of the room. So Nero, as I was saying, uh, believed he was all that, uh, it, it, to use maybe a, an old Latin phrase. He, uh, he, would, he believed he was the best player of musical instruments, that he was a master orator and poet. And so he would enter, just like you know, they would have back in the Greek times, he would enter these contests. For oration and so he would give speeches and he would recite poetry uh, and, and and actually enter the contest as one of the contestants and as far as we can tell from you know the people that won the contest back then he was in fact the most incredible orator and and poet of his time because he won all the contests <laughs> you know uh, he would enter chariot races and apparently he was also the best chariot racer of that time. They, they actually created a new sport in the Olympics just for Nero. I mean, he was that kind of person, but he was also a tyrant. He killed his, he killed his mother because he was suspicious that she was trying to undermine his authority. He killed his wife for the same reason. He thought she was trying to plot against him. And he would kill anyone that he was suspicious was trying to overthrow him. And Nero did not like Jewish people. Of course, if you think that you are the representation of the divine and there's a group of people that say, no, there is a living God and we will not bend the knee to you, that, that would get under a man's skin. And so he was, uh, he was not a fan of the Jewish people and especially this sect of Jewish people called Christians. They were not popular at this time. It was not in vogue. It was not something that lots of people would flock to. They were thought of as a very strange cult. And they are the ones, we think, at least one historian tells us, that Nero blamed for the big fire in Rome in 64. There's a big fire, went through Rome, destroyed much of Rome. Some people say Nero actually started the fire or stoked it. He kind of wanted it to happen so he could renovate. Uh, but then he had to blame somebody. Everybody blamed Nero. They were saying, yeah, he sat on the hill playing his lyre while the whole city burned. But Nero had to divert attention. So he did what? And he good politician would do at the time and said oh it's those guys and he pointed the finger over at the Christians who kept talking about how the world would end in some big fire and so they were blamed so it was about that time that this book is written my point for telling you all that is to say imagine being a group of people who have an unpopular belief who are looked down upon as being strange a little out of place in their culture and who are not supported by the local government at all in fact even being blamed and pointed to as being evil by the local government. 
This letter is written to that type of people. So as you're reading this letter, you're going to hear these warnings, and we're going to get into one of those today. But I want you to hear that the warning is, is meant to be an encouragement, to say, hang in there. I understand you're living in tough times. You are about to go through an incredible persecution. But you, you alone, are anchored to something that is real. Do not give that up. Do not let go of that which ties you to the living God. And so the letter was probably written on a piece of parchment, much like this, maybe several pieces of parchment, and uh, would have been sent there to Rome and then read in this congregation where a group of Christians had, had gathered. And many times, over and over again, you're going to hear a phrase similar to what we read in chapter 10, uh, where the writer says, do not throw away your confidence. Now, you'll hear me say the writer of Hebrews or the author of Hebrews, because we don't know who actually wrote Hebrews. Sometimes I'll slip and say, Paul tells us, blah, blah, blah. The early church fathers actually associated Hebrew with Hebrews with all the other letters of Paul. So it's probably not incorrect to refer to uh, at least Paul's way of thinking when you read Hebrews or are commenting on a verse in Hebrews. But we really don't know who wrote it. Uh, we're pretty sure Paul did not. It, uh, Hebrews certainly agrees with all of the other letters that are written by Paul. In fact, it agrees with letters written by Peter and John and the others in the New Testament. Uh, but we don't have anybody who signed Hebrews. And the way that the writer of Hebrews says things, the phrases that are used, the words that are used, are not those of any other author in the New Testament. So we're left just saying, the writer of Hebrews. But the, the letter, you need to understand, even though we don't know the author, it was circulated in, those, in that first century. It was circulated right along with the collection of letters from Paul. So as these letters were copied and then sent in a collection from one church to another, Hebrews was one of the books that went along with them. And its main message is, don't give up. Now let's read the very first paragraph in Hebrews before we flip over to chapter 5. But as a reminder of the foundation of Hebrews, the writer tells us that long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he created the world. So realize the writer of Hebrews here is introducing you to Jesus. And he says that it's through Jesus, the one who will inherit all things, that the whole world, all the, the entire age is created. He is the radiance of of the glory of God and the exact imprint. Remember that word character. He is the character of God, not meaning the moral character, but the actual, you know, in, in uh, Greek coinage, the character was the image on a coin. And Jesus is the exact imprint of God's nature. And he upholds, this word upholds uh, is the, the image that comes to mind is water buoying up a ship or a strong man getting under a, a heavy load and getting under it and upholding this heavy load. He upholds the entire universe. Really, the word there, instead of universe, it just says everything. He upholds everything by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Um, it's not a bad idea. Every time you read through Hebrews or every time that you read a portion of Hebrews to go back to this very first paragraph because there's the summary of the whole book. And as I've said many times before, it's unfair to drop into just one part of this book, study it, and then walk away. Uh, it's, it's a letter. It's one sustained argument, and it's meant to be read from start to finish. But at any point during that reading from start to finish, you get lost or you think, where, where are we in this argument? It's always helpful to go back to this very first paragraph because there he gives you the summary of the, the whole book which is very much like one of those uh, uh, musical scores in a symphony where he starts out real soft and then it builds and then it kind of, uh, you know, the, the, the tone and the temper comes down a little bit and then it rises again, but the next time a little bit higher and then it comes back down again. And with each exhortation, it keeps rising until you get to about chapter 11 and then 12 where you hear this huge crescendo and we'll get there in a few weeks. But that's where we're headed. And if you ever get lost, you can come back to chapter 1. Today we're going to talk about warnings. I don't know if you can see this, uh, but we recognize something in our culture, uh, which was probably true to some extent back then too, but uh, 
there's this phenomena of alarm fatigue or warning fatigue or optimism bias, I've heard it called, where people just ignore warning signs. Uh, and, and it's probably because in our culture there are so many warning signs on so many different things from the food that you eat to places you walk into to roads you drive down. Uh, you know, there are so many warnings that you just start to ignore warnings. So there's two signs here just to emphasize that. You can't read this probably from the back, but it says here, do not, what does that say, climb, play on, or around the pipe. And you see people are all over the pipe. <laughs> And of course, this sign, something you might see here in Alaska even, danger, rock falls, serious risk of injury or death. Stay away from the cliffs. And of course, somebody decides to put their house, you know, <laughs> you know right there. Uh, we tend to be that way. We're certainly that way in the field of medicine. We have something that we know is a problem, which is called alarm fatigue. Any of you who have stayed in a hospital or stayed overnight with someone in the hospital know that the place is filled with the cacophony of sirens and alarms and beeps and warnings and after a while either it will drive you nuts or you just start ignoring it and imagine what it's like for the nursing staff for the medical staff for people who live in that environment they actually quit hearing any of those alarms and it, it becomes a problem because if an alarm goes off and it means something serious is happening it's kind of the chicken little effect you know they they, they, don't even, they don't even hear it. So now they're in the medical literature. There are all kinds of suggestions about how do you get people to hear the alarm again? Or how do you reduce this thing called alarm fatigue? Uh, when, I was, when I was in medical school, we were rounding. You know, when they're teaching doctors, we all kind of circle up together. And they, they run us through the hospital. And we go from one patient to the other. We had gone to visit a patient one morning. And uh, she had, you know, one of these pumps right beside her bed. And right in the middle of our visitation with the patient and learning about the patient, the uh, bedside unit just kept going off with this beep, 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 and it interrupted our conversation. We couldn't learn. Nobody could concentrate. It just kept going beep. So finally, one of the guys standing next to us, now, of course, this is a group of medical students. We were not nursing staff, so this is meant to be honoring to the nursing staff and all of you who are nurses. You know how to make those things go off and stay off and program. They don't teach that to us. And so we're standing there around the patient. Finally, one of my colleagues says, uh, oh, I know how to turn that off. And he walks over and he hits a couple buttons. And sure enough, it goes off for about 30 seconds. And then beep, beep, <laughs> beep, and it interrupts us. And so in frustration, another one of my colleagues says, well, I know how to fix that. And he walks over and he just unplugs the whole thing, <laughs> unplugs the pump. And about 30 seconds later, the thing goes beep, <laughs> beep, beep, because they have battery backup, right? <laughs> And we couldn't turn off, you know, we couldn't turn off the alarm. My point in telling you all that is to say that in the book of Hebrews, you're going to get five different alarms. It shows up five different times. The first one is here in chapter 2. In fact, I'll show you the first one here. It shows up again in chapter 3. And then we're going to get to the third and the loudest alarm today. And that's what I want you to pay attention to or to watch for <clears throat> is when the writer of Hebrews sounds this alarm and you can try to push the buttons and make it go away, it's going to come back in chapter 3. You can try to unplug the unit, it comes back in chapter 5 and chapter 6. And you can try to get rid of it again, he's going to come back in chapter 10. But you're meant to hear it. It keeps coming back as a safety measure to make sure you don't develop this alarm fatigue as you read through the book of Hebrews. The first warning was this, and you'll remember when he got to chapter 2, after telling us that Jesus is greater than the angels, and he says, therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. So that we're not carried away by our culture or the times. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every sin or every transgression or disobedience received just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? And the warning there is, pay attention to what you're learning. Don't let go of it so that we don't drift away. Don't be like that person who, having ignored the warning signs, now ignores the very uh, uh, people who have arrived to rescue you. And so the writer of Hebrews says, don't ignore such a great salvation. That's the first time you hear this alarm. The second time shows up in chapter 3. It's actually much more extensive than just this verse, but it's a way of, of illustrating for you how this, this theme will come back over and over through Hebrews. Take care, brothers, lest there be any of you in any of you an evil, unfaithful, or unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. 
And again, this term or this idea of falling away or drifting away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it's called, in quotes, today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold to our original confidence firm to the end. So again, you hear this warning. Don't let go. Hang on tight. It's like in, uh, in rock climbing. We teach people when you're, I don't know if any of you have gone through the training either on the rock wall here or if you've actually done the real rock climbing, uh, but one of the things they teach us when you're learning how to repel, you know, and jump down the cliff, you have to rely totally on that rope, but you never let go of that backhand. Don't let go. Uh, that's your break. That's, what, that's your safety line. And the writer of Hebrews is saying that. You're holding on to something that is real, that is true, that will last forever. Speaking here about Jesus, do not let go. And so you hear that warning again in chapter 3. Now we're going to get over to chapter 5. Um, but I wanted to remind you of what we had talked about last week. So I appreciate Darren McLaughlin came in and taught last week, and he took you through the introduction to Jesus as being a high priest. Now, most of us grew up in a spiritual environment, a religious environment, or a part of churches in which the term priest probably has a vague Old Testament meaning. Uh, some of you may have grown up in churches where uh, there are priests, uh, for instance, the Catholic Church, and so you have an understanding of priests that would fit more of that mold. You almost have to back away from all of that to understand what the writer of Hebrews is, is going to tell us about Jesus. You have to put on the, the understanding of uh, a first century Jewish person's perspective of what it meant to be a priest, and we're going to get there. But when you first hear this, that Jesus is the high priest, you may think, well, what, is, what does that mean? And the image that comes to mind may be a person standing up front officiating a service or the image, if you have an Old Testament image of somebody standing in front of an altar, you know, holding up the animals for sacrifice and then going in to the temple. Uh, and it's important just to back away from all of that for a minute and allow the writer of Hebrews to take you on a tour of the old tabernacle or the temple. And we'll get there. But he begins by saying that Jesus is this term high priest. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. And that high priest is Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession, uh, or let us hold fast to the logos, our word. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted or tested just as we are, yet is without sin. And that word tempted or tested, you know, the image that may come to mind is Jesus being tempted by the devil. Remember the three different temptations there uh, in and around Jerusalem after his baptism and he came back, you know, from his time in the wilderness. And that is true. He was tempted. He was tested then. But the word here, temptation, is not merely the word attempted to do something wrong or tempted to do something evil. It's the word testing. And what it's saying here is that Jesus has been tested to prove his quality, to prove his worth. He has been tested in every way, just like you are tested. You might remember earlier in Hebrews, he took us and introduced this idea of the incarnation, that God, the living God, became man. And he didn't just walk into the earth as a man, as an adult. It's not that Jesus just showed up at his baptism and then will leave, you know, there at the cross. Uh, he, uh, it's not that Jesus just showed up at age 12, you know, at the temple. If you ask when, when did God become incarnate? At what point in that lifespan would you say the living God became a man? And you look at all of Jewish history, at least that portion of history that we're given, and you see that it starts out broad. There's a, there's a man and a woman and a garden. Of course, they mess up. They get cast out. Then the population of the earth swells, and it narrows down to Noah you know, and, and his family, and then spreads out again, people all over the earth. But then we follow just one group of people, which becomes the Jewish nation, we follow them to Egypt, and then they escape from Egypt, and they're brought up. But this, this huge story gets more and more narrow until it comes down to a very fine point. And that point, if you will, is, is a, a little girl saying her prayers when God comes and says, you will be the mother of the Savior of the world. 
and at that moment God becomes incarnate as as a see if you can get your brain around this Mary could not have known all of this God became incarnate as as a one cell human being that's where the incarnation begins and that one cell becomes two becomes three grows to become a child that is born who grows up who goes through all of those stages of development into adulthood and then is as an adult male that God incarnate goes to the cross and dies for the sins of the whole world three days later is resurrected the point there is that there is there is no human experience no human test that Jesus did not experience and he we are being told is the one being in heaven who is your high priest and we'll understand more of what that means in a minute but this is getting into a deep deep theological point and in that point is that the one being in all of heaven who knows what it is to be tested in every way that you are tested is the one who is standing in heaven on your behalf and so that's what he's introducing us to here in chapter 4 and then chapter 5 says, For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God. So again, the high priest is standing there before God, arguing the case for mankind. And the priest offers gifts and sacrifices for sins. Now the priest can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward. Don't you like that way the writer of Hebrews refers to you? You ignorant and wayward? Since he himself, meaning the priest, is beset with the same weaknesses. So the idea is that the priest is a person just like those whom he serves and when he walks before God it's in representation of, of the others who bear the same sins the same weaknesses and because of this he is obligated to offer sacrifice first for his own sins just as he does for those of the people and not to take and no one takes this honor for himself but only when called by God just as Aaron was so also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And he also says in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, if you're taking notes or want to write this down, you'll notice that the writer of Hebrews keeps bringing us back to Psalm 110. Sometime go back and read through Psalm 110. That's where a lot of these phrases come from. And the writer of Hebrews introduces us again to this strange character named Melchizedek. And we're not going to get to him this week. This is the advertisement for next week. But you're meant to say, who is this strange character who you'll find up out next week just sort of shows up on the scene. It's kind of like you're watching a, a musical and suddenly this strange character just sort of walks out. And you think, where did that character come from? And comes in the scene, does one little act, and then walks off the stage. And then you find out later, after the whole thing is over, somebody comes back and says, you realize that was the key character. <laughs> you think, well, who was that? Uh, you know, let's, let's follow. Where does he go? And so we're introduced to Melchizedek here, but we're not told who he is. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up, and by, I like that phrase, in the days of his flesh. You know, this means during the time that Jesus was walking among us. Uh, he offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears. And you need to hear that, that Jesus not only bore the sufferings and difficulties of being a human being, he also bore yours. And he, uh, you know, when he prayed, you hear this, this weight uh, in his voice and in even, you know, at one point the sweat of tears, I mean, sorry, the sweat that was like drops of blood. But you, you read that phrase, we're standing there in front of Lazarus' tomb, Jesus wept. He experienced this weight of uh, the burden on humanity. How did I get st stuck in that? Anyway, with loud cries and tears, to hear him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what was suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obeyed him being designated by God a high priest. So Jesus is designated by God as a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And there it is again. Who is this strange character that comes up and I have to practice, you know, saying his name ten times by myself alone just so I can say it out loud, you know, in front of people. Where does this, where does this come from? Who is this person and what does he mean? And so he's going to tell us. 
But before he does, watch this transition in chapter 5, verse 11. He says, about this, talking about Jesus being this priest in the order of Melchizedek, about this, we have much to say. And it's really hard to explain since you have become so dull of hearing. And so your teacher gets to this point where he's ready to say, I have something amazing to share with you. This is going to blow your mind. And then he pauses and recognizes his audience and says, I don't think you're quite ready to hear it yet. And so he takes a step back and says, I have so much to tell you about Melchizedek, about Jesus as the high priest, but I don't know if you're ready for it yet. And you, your eyebrow raises, what do you mean? I'm not ready for it yet. And he goes, well, here's, here's what I'm saying. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you, and specifically to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. It's a reference to uh, your babies. You know, babies start out with the colostrum and then have mother's milk for the first year up to five years of life. And it's only after that that you can handle the solid food. You could translate that the tough meat. Uh, it's uh, it's the, the food that you chew on. You're not, you're not ready for that yet. It's almost like he says you haven't grown your spiritual teeth yet. You're not ready for solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. Anytime you see that word righteousness, we have to be careful with that because we tend to use the word righteous in a religious sense or a spiritual sense. The word there, righteous, even though this isn't the right tr- translation it may be helpful to interpret that as rightness because what the word really means is when you ever you see this word righteousness especially in the book of Hebrews or the book of Romans really what he's talking about is making the world right again doing things right again being the person you were made at the first to be in other words to to take what is wrong and make it right and, and that's what you should be skilled at doing at this point, is understanding the word of being made right again. But you can't because you're a child. But solid food is for the mature. Now, the word mature is, again, not the connotation of someone who is um, just grown up as an adult. It's the, it's, the word here is teleos. It's the one who has reached their purpose, their final um, uh, purpose for being, that they have, they have reached that state or that idea and and in the Jewish mind that was one of the words that would remind them of the word Shalom so in the Jewish mind one of the most important words in Hebrew is the word Shalom and most of the time that's translated peace so if you meet a person who is a Jewish today or speaks Hebrew a lot of times they will greet you by saying Shalom and when you leave they'll say Shalom and it means peace but it means more than just absence of war you know if I say to you shalom I'm not just saying I hope you don't go to war today you know when I say peace what I'm saying is I hope that your life today is complete and is full and so sometimes that word is translated as teleos and so that's part of the idea that comes to mind the other word that should come to mind is the word salvation so though we think of salvation again in sort of a religious context In their day, that word salvation is one of the ways that the word shalom would have been translated. Again, it means to be right with God again, for everything to be as it was meant to be in the first place. And the writer of Hebrews is saying that solid food is for those who are complete, where everything is right again, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. The picture that comes to mind for anybody living in Rome would be that of the uh, athletes who are training for games so you know Nero who probably didn't practice for one athletic event at all but still he was excellent you know he, he won them all uh, so I don't want to speak bad about Nero there but for those athletes that were really trying to win these events uh, they would practice you know in the gymnasium and uh, and there in the gymnasium it was part of the daily routine you would finish your work you would go to the gymnasium they would douse you with this oil and then you would go and you would exercise and work out and then you would go and dip in tepid water and then hot water and then jump in the cold water and then sort of dry off at the end there was this whole kind of ritual you went through not like at the Alaska Club today I mean when people go to work out but that's the image that's meant to come to mind was a group of people who are exercising and he says here 
that solid food is for those who are complete, for those who have their powers of discernment trained here, not exercising their body, but have trained their powers of discernment exercising them so that they recognize the difference between good and evil and that's an important point to catch that it's possible to get to a state where you just go with the flow where you do what whatever the culture suggests that you fit in at work you fit in at you know in your neighborhood that you fit in in the schools uh, that you just sort of go with the flow as opposed to exercising that discernment with every decision with every comment with every lesson that you prepare to teach with every action that you take with every service you render to somebody else uh, with every proposal that is stuck before you to say hey would you sign your name here that you've you've practiced this these powers of discernment to say is this good or evil if I take this to its logical conclusion do we end up in some eternal horror or if we take this to its logical conclusion do we end up in a state of standing before God and hearing him say well done you know, my good and faithful servant. It's, it's a lifestyle of practicing that discernment, he says. That's what the solid food is for. And that's what he wants for you. So don't take this as an insult. It's a, it's a lead up to the warning. And so in chapter 6, he says, Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ. That word doctrine there is the word logos. Let's, let's leave the elementary. And the word elementary is beginning. So let's leave the, the words of Christ that we started with. And go on to, again, that word maturity, to being complete. Now, the word there, he's not saying let's forget the early words of Christ or let's forget the elementary teachings. He's saying let's, let's just accept that these are the elementary teachings and let's just set them right here so that we can talk about much more mature things. Does that make sense? I want to make sure you don't think he's saying, ah, oh, forget all that stuff you learned. <laughs> he's saying let's, let's take what you know to be true, the elementary teaching, and set it aside. It's sort of like when we all started grade school, we learned our ABCs. And I bet you could sing the song right now. It goes to the tune of Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. Or does Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star go to the tune of ABCs? Uh, which came first? I don't know. But it's A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Yeah, you all know the right order of your letters. And uh, Ada, can I, can I use a story? I, Ada, was, Ada is our librarian at our house. And uh, she's working at West High School helping out in their library. And she says it's amazing how you're going, you know, with a stack of books in your hand. And this is at the high school level. And you're going through figuring out where to put the book, you know, in the order. And, and you're trying to remember, well, does G come before H or I before J? Where does it come in? And so guess what you revert to? You do this too. It's not just Ada. But she, she fessed up to it. Yeah, you break into the song that you learned when you were in elementary school. A, B, C, D, E. You still do that. It's something that's fundamental. You don't even think about it. But wouldn't it be strange if we went over to the University of Alaska and went into a literature course, and we walked in for the first day of this class on you know, literature in which we're either going to learn writing or we're going to learn reading, and the teacher said, you know, our first chapter today is the ABCs, and uh, l let's all sing it together. And they, and they sing the ABCs. And you go for the second day, and they're still singing the ABCs. And you go the third day of the class, and you're, again, you get to midterms. And the midterm exam is can you write out the ABCs in order? You know, there's a point at which you say, this is a strange class. By this point, they should be beyond knowing the ABCs and being able to put this together in words and sentences and concepts and even thinking about things that are quite abstract. Uh, if you understand that, you get an idea of what the writer of Hebrews is saying here. When he says, hey, it's, it's a bit strange that you're still dealing with the elementary teachings of Christ. Let's set those aside. Let's accept that so that we can move on to what we, are, we, we need to be thinking about. And so he says, let's not, let's not lay again the foundation of repentance. And then he, oh, let me pause here to say, he's about to give us a list. So this is one of those times where I say, pay attention, because he's about to give you a list. And for some of you who are new at following Christ, this is a great list of some of the first things to get your head around. So he like a good parent who says, you know, I, I'm not going to say it again. Go wash the dishes, you know. And, and, and really, you're saying, I'm not going to say this again, and then you say it again. The writer of Hebrews sort of does that. He goes, we're not going to lay again the foundation of all this, but let me give you what the foundation is. <laughs> and so he gives you the, the list. And the list is this. Here's the foundational principles. Repentance from dead works of faith. Excuse me. Re uh, repentance from dead works 
and of faith towards God. There's actually six things in this list. So the first of those is repentance. There is a foundational ABC kind of principle of following Christ is repenting. The word repentance there means changing your mind away from acts and works that lead to death and turning towards acts and works that lead to life. Specifically faith toward God. Faith is the one thing that you and I possess as followers of Christ with which we can impress God. It's the one thing that turns the head of Jesus is the faith of a person. That faith counts as if you have done everything right according to the book of uh, Romans. And so this faith is a powerful thing and that's the second foundational principle. And of instruction about washings. Um, I think some of your texts may, depending on the version you use, it might say uh, ceremonial washings or washings. That, that word is actually baptisms. And that's a foundational principle is understanding uh, and learning about what is the meaning of baptism. So if a person is baptized, this is not just a ceremony where a person gets wet and, you know, and comes up and walks out and that's just sort of what Christians do. That is, that is one of the most powerful sermons that you will ever hear on what it means to follow Christ when a person dies, they're buried, and they're raised. Uh, the term here is plural. It's washings. So it refers to maybe not only water baptism, but perhaps also baptism of the Holy Spirit. And he's saying that's a foundational concept is those two types of baptism that you see in Christianity or in the early writings of Jesus and the laying on of hands, which is related to baptism. You remember any time someone was baptized early on, especially through the book of Acts, there was this laying on of hands. That could be referring to the time that the Holy Spirit, in some cases, was passed on to individuals like those Samaritans who had been baptized, but you know, they didn't have the Holy Spirit yet, so the apostles go, lay their hands on them, and they remember Simon the sorcerer. I think he saw him and said, hey, I like that power. Can I lay my hands on people so they get the Holy Spirit? And, of course, they, he learns better. <laughs> that's not what the laying on of hands is for. But that's an elementary teaching. could also be referring to the giving of authority. So when authority was given to an individual in the early church, there would be this laying on of hands. The resurrection of the dead is another foundational principle. The idea that when we die, it's not that our body and our soul separate and our soul goes off to eternal bliss and the body just corrodes. There is a a bodily resurrection where our bodies are remade in the same way that Jesus' body, remade, but in a form that will live forever. And eternal judgment, that one day God will rid the world of evil. It will happen. There will be a day when God wipes evil away from the world. Now, those six things that you read here, that's, that's the ABCs, A, B, C, D. And there are some of those that you'll look at and go, whoa, I didn't know that that uh, D there actually existed, <laughs> you know. And if you see that, then realize that's something to go study. That's something to go, you know, work on. The writer of Hebrews does not go into each of those on purpose. He doesn't say, hey, you need to study this. Instead, he says, here's the foundational principles. And then comes the warning. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt for the land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those uh, for whose sake it is cultivated receives a blessing from God but if it bears thorns and thistles it is worthless and near to being cursed and its end is to be burned and so in this passage, the writer is saying, if a person tastes, if you will, heaven, tastes what it is to know the word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away, it is impossible for that person to be brought back to repentance. The word there is actually anakino, which means to be renewed in repentance. And, and there's a lot of debate, you know, on this passage. And is this passage saying that if a person has been a Christian, a follower of Christ, and they fall away, is that saying, don't even try, they can't come back? Uh, or is it saying, no, this is, you know, referring to a person who's never really a Christian in the first place. 
or even if they went through the motions of becoming a Christian, they've actually left it, and now they use what they know against Christians and, you know, and are shaming publicly uh, Christ himself. Regardless, the writer of Hebrews isn't trying to answer that question, even though we try to use the passage you know, to answer some pretty uh, big questions culturally. But here's what the writer of Hebrews wants you to catch. It's that if you were to let go of this rope, there's no other way back. So when we teach people, when we go rock climbing, uh, we teach them to honor this rope. You never step on the rope because you might grind little shards of rock into that rope and it caused small cuts that would you know, cause the rope to eventually break. Uh, you handle it with care. You wrap it. You don't ever kink it really tight. You, know, you wrap it loosely. Uh, when you tie your knots, you always check your knots twice. And the reason is that once you, especially if you're rappelling, but if you're climbing and you know, have that top rope on there, uh, if you fall, it's okay because you've got this rope, and it will catch you. It'll hold thousands of pounds, so it'll catch you even if you fall a distance, and then it kind of bungees you know, to, to the end. That rope will hold you. But if you let go of the rope or if you say, ah, I don't need a rope and just leap off the cliff, there's, there's nothing there that will catch you. And that's what the writer of Hebrews is saying. That's your warning sign. It's this big sign saying, do not go further without your hand on the rope. Does that part make sense? And if it does, then the next phrase, and we'll end with this, though we speak in this way, yet in your case, and this is where I was saying, he's not talking bad about you. He says, in your case, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation, for God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and your love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, to have the full assurance of hope to the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. And we should end there today. Uh, And next week we'll pick up with, now that he's warned you, don't let go of the rope, he's going to bring you back to this deep uh, introduction to what it means for Jesus to be a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. And once you understand what that means, you stand back and think, whoa, I have someone in heaven, the one being in all of heaven, who knows what it's like to be tested as I am, and he's pulling for me. And that's where we get to uh, next week. If you have questions, I'll stay around afterwards here between class. Uh, And then next week, we'll jump back into the rest of here in chapter 6 and be introduced to this strange character, Melchizedek, and find out his place. Thank you for being here.